So I am Darcy Hubbard. I am the executive director of CASA, Fairfax CASA, and I'm here today with two of my favorite people, Patty and Ed Rager. Um, hi, how are hello. you? Um, Patty and Ed have been CASAs with us. Do you guys know what year you joined? It's been 15 years now. 15. Yeah. So they've been here a lot longer than I have been here, and they are just two of the most lovely, wonderful human beings. Um, why don't we start? Can you tell me why did you like? How did you become CASAs? Why did you become CASAs? How did this? How did this happen? Well, um, both Ed and I were leaving the corporate world, and we decided we wanted to do something with heart. We wanted to volunteer our time. We wanted to be together and work with children. And so we saw a notice for an info session and we attended that, met some great CASAs and we got hooked. Yeah, and I had uh, spent a couple of years volunteering with the hospice program. And although that, that was very rewarding, uh, I really wanted to move to the beginning of life rather than the end of life. And so we felt like if we could work as a team uh, we would we would be able to make a contribution together. So, so you guys you do work as a team, right? You guys have always worked every single one of your cases together. Right. Uh, well, actually, we worked two cases together. That's true. We're okay. still working together. Um, I worked with an infant, a newborn, actually, okay. um, whose mom unfortunately was in prison, mm. and I worked on that case by myself. Okay. And it did have a happy ending. The family members wound up adopting her. That's um, you guys, the other two cases we've worked on together. Yes, right. Do you know off the top of your head how many kids you've served? About, I think, 10 or 12. 12. I had 11. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because you had the I case had, with. I had one case with two young boys um, by myself, too, before we start, before we teamed up with a with a big group, so. Okay. What's so great is that if there's a family that has multiple siblings, then we can work together. Sometimes there are even two caseworkers or two attorneys on very large cases and uh, two CASAs. And the beauty of it is because of confidentiality, of course, you can't be speaking to anyone about the cases. But when we're working on the case together, we can share. That's right. And, you know, in case anybody is watching this who doesn't know, um, the expectation in our office is that when we assign you a case, you will start that case and then not sign off on that case, not be finished with that case until the case itself is closed. So, you know, our cases average 26 months right now. Um, however, you guys <laughs> hold the record in the office. Um, for the longest case, and I talk about you all the time, the longest case in the office ran for 10 years, and you guys stayed on that case for 10 years. Yes. Um, and there were seven children in that mm -hmm. case, when we started, they were aged two to eight. And because of a series of appeals, the children wound up being in foster care much longer. And um, we're still in touch with uh, some of the children who were adopted. The adoptive parents said that we could you know, be involved with them. And then also the oldest child who's now almost 24 this month, we're still in touch with her in close touch. So that child, reporting. that child aged out of the system at 18 because that was right. before we had fostering futures. And she's, you said almost 24? Yes. She'll be 24 this month, yeah. So you guys have been a support to her for an additional six years. And we and we continue to stay in touch with her. And she calls us when she's got something that she's proud of or when she needs something. Um, we get with her occasionally for lunch. Um, and so we really we really keep that keep that door open. So and we've been really her only constant. There have been so many people in and out of her lives. And uh, we've been able to see her for birthdays and graduations and for Sweet 16. And mm. um, I think that's the beauty of being a CASA, that you're the, the one constant. You always show up wherever the child winds up going, that you, you're always there for them. I think I counted once. I think I, I know I counted once. I went in and, and pulled that child's 
um, information. And over the course of 10 years, if you counted all of the foster homes, residential treatments, hospitalizations, over 10 years, it was well over 25 different placements it's and so placements so out, outside of Fairfax, Virginia. Right. Yes. And we traveled quite a bit. Yeah. And, um, but she always looked forward to our visits. And, you know, we thought as older volunteers that maybe she wouldn't want to go out with us, but we walked on the beach together. We've been numerous places with her and she's always proud of us. I remember one time at Christmas, there was a holiday concert at the residential facility where she was and she grabbed us by the hand and actually took us right up to the front row. She was so proud that we were there. And she always said, please don't come during professional hours to visit me, come during family time because she wanted her peers to think that she had family visiting her when there was no family to visit her. And you guys did that. Yeah. yeah. Of course you did. Of course you did. It was, you know what? It meant at least as much to us and probably more than it even did to her. So she, love her. So that case closed six years ago. She's going to be 24 and you guys are still part of her life. That's amazing. That's amazing. What would you say? Well, I think she's really lucky too to have you. Um, what would you say has been the most rewarding part of this for you? Well, I tell you, for me, the most rewarding part is when you follow a case and the children get adopted. And in this large case that we're talking about, the two younger uh, kids in this case, the day they were adopted, uh, we went to the courthouse with the judge in the ceremony. And at that ceremony, the kids said, yeah, we're adopting you. So they adopted us and we still are in contact with, with those kids through their, through their, through their now parents. That's awesome. Yes. So we got adopted on adoption day. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> and you know, the other thing is when families can be reunited, that is really just a fantastic thing. When you see how hard parents and grandparents especially have worked to be able to keep the child with them in the family. Yeah. And uh, it's very, very rewarding to see. What do you think, is there a moment that stands out for you guys? You mentioned the adoption thing, that's probably tough uh, to top. But is there any, are there any moments, good or bad, that really stand out from the last 15 years? Oh, there's so many. Yeah, I've got, I've got one too, the case where I had those uh, two young, young guys um, on my own. Um, it, there came a point in time where they, they moved out of the area. And uh, so I wasn't going to be able to see them anymore. So I made arrangements with the school to go have lunch with them. And they had set up an office and there were the, the older of the two uh, met them separately and they were in uh, different grades. Mm -hmm. So we, we got into the, um, into the principal's office that he had turned over to us so we could have our lunch. And I brought in, you know, McDonald's and we were going to have lunch together. He said, oh, Ed, come on. He said, I want to take you to the cafeteria. I want to, <laughs> I want to introduce you to my friends. So he takes me into the cafeteria and they're all wondering who's, oh, this is Ed, this is my casa. So I was just blown away. It was everything I could to hold back the tears, <laughs> even now. Yeah. But uh, that, that was a real rewarding experience for me. So how old do you think he was at that point? I think he was about 11 years old at that wow. point. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm an old man. So, you know, oh. <laughs> well, I am. I mean, for, for him at 11, I'm an old yeah. man. So I thought he, he isn't going to want to be seen with me, but and yeah, he brought me oh, right into the cafeteria and introduced me to his friends at the table. So that's impressive. Cause 11, you know, it'd be different if he was like five or six, right. But right. 11, that's like yeah. bordering teenage years. I mean, that's when they start to really be aware of what their peers think. And that says a lot. I have to brag on Ed too, because he took them places they had never been. They had never been on the Metro to ride mm -hmm. the train. Um, he took them to the Air and Space Museum, bowling, to movies, uh, got them involved in a young men's club to learn how to become a man and mm -hmm. how to carry yourself because he really didn't have, even, neither of them really had a male role model. Male no, 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 no,
I think that's so great. I think, you know, I, I try to instill that in, in the new classes, you know, with our older youth that they can take places and do things with like, to try and expose them to things that they may not be exposed to in their own home life or normally or haven't been exposed to and to really instill in them that they have a place at every table and they have every right to be, you know, at every museum and to ride the metro and to, you know, go places where they've never gone before. They have every right to do that. Right. I love that you guys did that. The other thing, since it's the holiday season, um, one thing that happened with the now almost 24 year old that we're talking about, mm -hmm. she was in a residential facility and it was Christmas and the staff were all taking off and they needed someone to take her for the day. And of course, one of the rules of CASA is that you don't bring, you know, the child to your home and all sure. that. And um, so we decided that we would go and pick her up and we went out uh, for a meal together. It's very hard to find places that are open, you know. Sure. We did gifts and all of that. She had never had homemade Christmas cookies before. We took her a big old tin of those. And then she wanted to go to the movies and it happened to be Twilight, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so on Christmas afternoon, we went and she was so happy. She was all snuggled up with her Edward blanket. I was just going to say, was she, was she team Edward or was she the wearer? Yeah, team Edward. 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 Yes. And I think that's one of my most memorable times. It really made, uh, made our Christmas to be with her. And it's like, you think about that. If, if it wasn't a CASA situation and it was just, you know, your own child or a niece or a nephew, like that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? It's just right. having dinner, making cookies, going to a movie. But for our kids, that is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the biggest part of that is that somebody showed up. Yes. You know, yes. somebody cared enough to do that with them on Christmas Day. So you've been with us for a long time and you've worked a lot of cases and you've, you've, been with a lot of kids and seen a lot why do you stay oh well I have to say like I said earlier we get more out of it really than we put into it and we try to put our heart and soul into it so that says how much we get and um, we are really blessed to work with a great group of people Darcy with you and your team our supervisor Donna and others, um, all of the CASAs, they come from all different walks of life, all ages, occupations, um, the attorneys, social workers, teachers, psychologists, there's just so much goodness. There's so many good people around who want to help kids. And we love being a part of that. Yeah, I couldn't say it any better than she just did. So <laughs> I have nothing to add. Smart man, Ed Rager. <laughs> so one of the things I've been thinking about for next year, for 2022, and, um, you know, we do our continuing ed trainings um, with the volunteers. And one of the things I was going to talk about maybe was defining success, right? Because we always talk about our, our, our role is not to be social engineers. Our role is not to create perfection. I think our role is to try and get these kids to a better place than they were when they came in, right? That's the goal, better. Um, and I think sometimes it's hard for people because they think there's gonna be these amazing happy endings where everything's tied up neatly with a beautiful bow and onto the next case. And that's not always the way it works out. So if you were sitting before a brand new CASA, how would you define success to them? What would you say a success looks like? It's a good question. I'd have to say success is when you watch that child get better, um, do positive things, make a connection, um, and just watch to, to see that they improve and help them along that, along that way. Uh, and each child, of course, is different uh, and their needs are different. Um, the case that we're currently in, um, the young man that we're continued to work with, we've got two of the two of the three have been taken care of with family members, 
Um, and we're working on the third one, which will also be with a family member. Uh, and we're watching him now transition from, uh, from a boy to a man. Um, and we actually visited him on his birthday last week. And he's been having some behavioral issues. So I had a chance with him to talk about that transition from going from a boy to a man. And he's now at 13 and he needs to be thinking about not, not any longer being a boy, but you need to learn how to be a man. And uh, just wanted to plant that seed in his head. Um, so I'm hoping that, that that little kernel will grow. Uh, so those kinds of things, um, if it works, I would call that success. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the best I can do. <laughs> that's good. The only thing I'll add is that what we hope for all of our children is that they have a happy home. And whether that's going back with the family or whether it's getting adopted, um, we also hope that they'll be able to finish school, finish high school, um, maybe even go to college, be able to support themselves, be a good citizen, um, be caring, and uh, try to help other people in their lives. And um, I think that we've seen a lot of success. We've seen a lot of heartbreak too, mm -hmm. um, but the successes far outweigh the heartbreak. I think so too. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you guys have given, I looked it up, it, the numbers are crazy. I mean, well over a thousand hours of your time um, and not just and not just on your cases. I mean, both of you come and, when we are bringing in new classes of volunteers, you guys speak to them. And every year when we do the race, you guys are out there, you know, helping out with different things. And you're just such great ambassadors to the program. And beyond that, you guys have always you know, been generous donors to the program. So as you know, somebody who gives so much time, why do you on top of that also contribute to the program financially? What why? Considering we don't give you any money for your gas, for you, me driving you crazy. I mean, you know, it's, well, it's, you know, you're a volunteer who's actually also investing in the program. We feel very blessed in our own lives that we grew up in the families that we grew up in. Um, and we just want to help. And when we left our, you know, other jobs, <laughs> Our paying jobs. I paying jobs where people years. gave you money. <laughs> uh, we decided that we wanted to volunteer with an organization that was worthwhile and that time is precious. And uh, we wanted to be able to make a real difference. We didn't want it to be just something very minimal. We wanted it to be something direct uh, that we're, you know, one on one with these children. Um, we're fortunate that Ed's former company does matching grants from their foundation, mm -hmm. which is really good for our volunteer work. Great. Um, and uh, we have enough things. When we have friends and they ask us what we'd like, we'd say, just make a little donation to CASA mm -hmm. in our name, um, rather than give us something that we really don't need. Yeah, there's so many organizations, uh, especially in this neck of the woods, Mm -hmm. uh, that are volunteer based organizations, but you never really know um, how that money is going to be used. But with Fairfax Casa, we know how that money is going to be used. And uh, so that's, that's definitely the place to put money. You can see what you can see the results of what you're giving. So, yes. And we see too the way you run the organization and the way the board runs the organization. And we know that a lot of extra money isn't being spent on anything frivolous, that it's all going for salaries and toward the kids. Yep. And we just couldn't do what we do without you and the supervisors who are helping us, guiding us when we run into roadblocks uh, or when we're writing our court reports. Um, and uh, so we just believe in CASA and we wanna put our money where our mouth is. And I appreciate that. You know, I always try to explain to new, potential new funders, people that are considering us, 
because our biggest expense truly is our salaries, everything else we do through volunteers, right? I mean, rent and that kind of stuff, insurance, all the administrative stuff that we have to have. Mm -hmm. but, but I have six supervisors that I pay and they deserve to be paid, right? But they each can supervise up to 30 of you. So I have 30 adults out in the community impacting on average two kids, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So paying that one supervisor trickles down to 30 people, which trickles down to on average about 64 children. It's an incredibly, I didn't come up with it. It's an incredibly brilliant cost-effective model yes. that I wish we could, I wish we could utilize that in other areas of um, social services and other areas of the government, because I feel like we get, you know, at least 500 inquiries a year about becoming a cost of volunteer and we swear in about 40 people, maybe uh, on average. So we're very selective and not selective, like elitist. I mean, most people self remove once they find out the time commitment and what it's going to look like, but we put people through such a rigorous program, um, to get to sit where you're sitting, um, because this work is so important and we're trusted so much by the community and the court that we have to get it right in terms of the people we put out there um that i feel like the the ex we the expenses are nothing compared to the value of what you guys do and the number of lives you impact every single year i mean it's just it's a brilliant model i wish we could do it across a million different things, but I'll take it for right now. Um, so last question. Mm -hmm. If anyone was watching this and they have nothing to do with CASA today, and they're like, that sounds kind of cool. Um, if they were considering becoming a CASA volunteer or considering making a donation, why should they? Why should they not just consider it, but why should they do it? They should do it and do it immediately. <laughs> if you want to change the world one child at a time. This is the way to do it. And I have a background in pediatric nursing. I saw things from the other side. And if you care about children, they're our future. Then, you know, consider CASA. I have nothing further to add to that. I know, right? That's that everything. I, she's so smart. That's my uh, girl. I just love her. She knows just what to say. I know. Well, I want to thank you both for um for doing this today and thank you for all you do. Thank you. You are just you. you are just gems. And I'm so lucky that I get to come to work and that you are part of my everyday, you know, the people that I deal with and the people that I get to have a small part of what they do. And I'm just grateful. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much. We appreciate it. Happy holidays. You too. Same to you. Okay. Merry Christmas.